To be completely honest, I hadn't actually heard about the game My Singing Monsters until a bunch of my subscribers started asking me to make a video based around it. And it seems like it's actually kind of weird that I'd never heard of it before, because it's a very popular game. Or at least it was when it came out 10 years ago, had a bit of a lull, and now is having a big resurgence. But all that is kind of irrelevant to me. The main thing I was excited about when I started looking into it was seeing that it's one of my favorite kinds of topics to work with. A bunch of very cartoony looking creatures that I can flesh out into more monstery versions of themselves. In this case, while well, I do that, rewriting their lore to set them in the world of all my dragon and monster videos. So let's take a crack at a new topic, shall we? Let's Let's go. Woo. Hit like if you want, subscribe if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. The more time I've spent as the overseer of my world, learning about all the truths in past mysteries I once thought to be myths, one question has recurred, growing louder and louder as time has gone on. What is the true origin of my world? There are, of course, many religions, past and present, that claim to have the answers, but I now more genuinely wonder, is one of them true? Are many of them true, simply giving alternate depictions of the same events? This more so came to mind lately as I was reminded of a lesser-known religion to my world, that I know for certain has some basis in reality. It is oft referred to as the Hymns of the Colossals. It tells of my world coming into being as the result of a massive explosion of sound that filled the void of eternity and spawned into being twelve celestials that controlled and guarded all elements. These celestials then created the earth and from it sprung the colossals, who were tasked with creating land and creatures through the power of music. They then spawned many islands and land masses full of creatures imbued with the power of song to bring the world into full being and life. Interpreting that into the things I know to be true about my world, that an overseer has always existed to watch over and guard it, it seems possible to me that these colossals could have been a group of overseers. But if that were the case, who were the celestials in these tales? Of course, these are all simply theories I may never have any way of verifying, but what I do know for certain is that there are still creatures in my world believed to be some of the ancestors of the original creatures of song. Unfortunately, the world has gone through many dark periods, and people were compelled over the centuries, for various reasons, to hunt down the creatures of song, always able to locate them due to their musical bellowing. The ones that remain alive to this day are angry and vengeful. They learned not to sing or play their music to keep themselves safe from being hunted, but in doing so repressed their core instincts to express their being through song. I just recently had to save a group of hunters from a near-extinct creature called an overgrowth bellowent, a beast specifically referred to in the hymns of the Colossals. The hunters had not even been seeking this creature, but they strayed too far into its territory and it struck out against them. I was luckily in the area at the time, and more luckily still, able to calm it through a method I was uncertain would even be successful as I attempted it. Now when I started studying the lore for My Singing Monsters, I did not think it was going to be very extensive. You know, it's a mobile game about you know, just creatures that make music. But when I started getting into it, the first video I pulled up on YouTube for the lore was 50 minutes long. 5-0, not 15. I did a lot of research for this video, but I feel like I only got through a small fraction of the actual lore. It is surprisingly extensive. In terms of this creature, I feel like I probably could have redesigned it more. I kind of just did a more fleshed out version of the creature and made it angrier looking to fit into the tone of the story. I referenced some images of gorillas because they've got that kind of muscular pot belly sort of look with the, you know, some fur parts, some more skin flesh kind of looking parts. But besides that, it really was just a more fleshed out version of the Entbrad. One thing I did partway through this drawing was I, I found that the head the, the beard specifically, the, the leaves around the chin were blending in too much with the leaves of the chest and back. And so what I did was I put a bit of a blue wash over the chest leaves to make sure that the head was a little bit more separate and popping out. Just enough to make sure that they still felt connected but that the head was separate. And I think that was a very nice touch on this piece and overall I'm super happy with how it came together. Even if I do think I probably could have done a little bit more redesigning to make it more monstery. But still, think this is super cool, and I hope you all like it.
As I stood before the hunters and the bellow ent, I was instinctively ready to draw my blade upon it, but was overcome with a sense of grief for this creature. I knew of its supposed history and that it was a creature of song that had been unable for ages to sing its music, so instead of striking, I held my ground and began to sing. Well, it's not a skill I oft publicly display, I have been told that I have a very calming singing voice, so I simply began in with a tune my sister, Brayla, once sang me when I was a child, prior to her death. The creature still wrapped me in its branches and lifted me towards its maw, roaring violently as it did, but I simply kept on singing, and soon, the beast's guard started to fall. The hunters noticed this, and coincidentally, some of them knew the song I sang. They began in with me, and soon the creature lowered me to the ground. Then it too joined in with the song, not in any human language, but still adding a bellowing bass to our tune. We continued through to the end of the song, and upon its completion, the creature kept on singing, and with a grin that seemed rare to its massive mouth, it marched off back into the forest. I continued to observe the creature for three days afterwards, and found it slowly singing its song more and more over those days. It seemed it was once more feeling safe to sing. I then traveled to all the surrounding towns to tell them of the creature's presence in their territory, and informing them that if the creature approached, to simply lower their weapons, sing along with it, and it would likely leave them be. But that then spurred me into a search for more of these creatures of song. If calming the bellow ent's rage was so simple as to show it that it was safe to once more create its music, then perhaps that was possible for more of these creatures. I asked through many more towns for anyone that had any information on more creatures of song in the region, and after a day of queries was told of an elemental that had awakened nearly one year ago on Mount Cana. The creature had sprung forth from this volcanic mountain and was making it very dangerous for any to traverse the surrounding hills. I flew over the region astride my dragon mount violet, and it wasn't long before I saw the orange glow of the beast from above. I lowered as close as I could, but the creature hurled clumps of magma from its hands towards us. We barely avoided some strikes, but mid-assault from the creature I began my song once more. Slowly, the attack ceased. Again, this method proved successful, and soon after the beast joined me in song, though this creature being able to replicate human voices in its own angelic tone. The voice was incredibly soothing, and I must say, this realization of the good I can so easily bring to these creatures is one of my proudest moments as the overseer of my world, and there are plenty more creatures I now know I can assuage with it. Now for this drawing, I was actually taking some inspiration from one of my own drawings that I did about a year ago in the Skylanders Monsters episode, the very similar format to this one, set in the same world and everything. I drew Eruptor as a more monstrous version of himself, and obviously that's just like a more masculine fire, lava, elemental kind of creature. So I was looking at that, doing this. I still think I like that old one a little bit more, but I am quite happy with how this one turns out. But one thing I do think about a lot when I'm doing an elemental kind of creature like this, or any creature that has an element as its core, is what to do with its eyes. If it's a creepier drawing, I'll often have the element, whatever it is, magma water kind of spilling out from its eyes, but then I think, do I make the eyes kind of blackened out, or do I have them glowing? I think I often go for the blackened out look, but for this one near the end of the drawing, I just felt it wasn't really working, because there were so many glowy parts on this character, I needed something even brighter and glowier to draw us to the creature's face. So I end up changing the eyes to more of a white hot glow, and I think that ends up working really well, combined with adding a little bit of smoke pluming off from its head. Really pleased with how this one finished up, even though I was a bit skeptical about it partway through. And I hope you all like it as well. After my success with the Elemental of Mount Cana, I once more went to the surrounding villages and informed them of how they could ensure the creature stayed calm in their presence, and implored them to spread this word, that it was possible to calm any creatures of song with this method. I then racked my own mind for any other tales of these creatures I'd heard as of late, what the most vicious and violent one may be that I could truly put this method to the test on. And that was when my mind stirred up a memory from years ago, the tale of the hissing plasmagast. 
It was a creature I'd learned about in my earlier days as a beast chronicler, and had been unwilling to consider as anything more than a folktale. It was said to be a very solitary creature that lived up in the ethereal mountains, in a terrain very few tried to summit, but those who did risked having their souls torn from their body by a phantom. Now I knew it was very likely this creature was indeed real. It had been some years since I heard these tales, so I knew it was entirely possible the creature, if it had been there at a time, was now gone, but I set off for the ethereal mountains all the same, and in the dead of night, eventually found what I sought. Or, more accurately, it found me. In the heat of our search, I was struck from Violet's back and hurled through the air until I was caught by a 30-foot-long, semi-translucent cat beast. I started up singing as quickly as possible, and while my voice was shaky at first from the tumble, I quickly steadied it, and it worked its same magic, possibly even more quickly than the previous two cases. What was different, however, was this creature did not sing along with me. Instead, phantasmal orbs spawned from its body, and it began to play them like drums, but echoing forth a sound like a buzzing organ. It played faster than I expected, but I sang quicker to match, and soon the song took on a different form, feeling more lively than previous renditions. The creature soon set me down, but I continued with more songs, and the creature easily played its orbs along to them, and I honestly can't say how long we went on, but by the time my voice grew strained, the sun was cresting over the horizon. I left the creature then in peace, with its echoing notes still ringing through the mountains as I left. I gotta say, I really like how cute and nice and peaceful the lore for this episode is. It kind of just evolved that way unintentionally at first, and I actually thought about fleshing out the lore a little bit more and just making this a story-focused episode, and I definitely think I could have done that, but I recently did a poll asking people what they like me to talk about most during my videos, and about 35% of people said lore and design notes, and then 60-something percent of people said just lore and stories, and very few people said they didn't want any stories, which was actually very reassuring knowing that I've been on the right trajectory with the fact that I've done mostly story-focused episodes over the last year and a bit. And on top of that, there were lots of very nice comments of people saying how much they like and appreciate the lore and stories. I really appreciate those. It's easy for me to think of the lore and stories as kind of a side thing because this channel started as an art channel, but seeing how many people really care about the lore and stories was very reassuring and nice for me. But anyway, these aren't design notes, are they? So in terms of the design of this creature, I'm very happy with how it turns out. I think the furry texturing ends up cool. I feel like it doesn't quite look phantom-y enough because I didn't really think about the fact that to make it look more like a phantom, I would have needed more things behind it to be seen through it. I erase part of its lower body a little bit, so that the mountains in behind its lower tail can be seen, but even that, it's only sort of noticeable, and probably only more so because I'm saying it so you'll notice it. I was hoping the phantom element of this would look a little bit like one of the superheroes as dragons I did in a community redraw about some time last year, from a subscriber named Neckskin Art, who I turned their phantom -y superhero into a phantom dragon in the same universe, and that one looked really cool because the creature had bones underneath the translucent skin, and I feel like that could have been a really cool element to add to this one, but I don't think completely necessary. Overall, I am quite pleased with this. At the end, I do change how the glowy orb orbs around it look, because they felt a little bit too bland. I still don't totally love the finished element of that part of the drawing, but I do think the updated ones look better than the ones I had on screen for most of this drawing. Quick little reminder that the art from this episode will be available as posters on my Teespring store, along with ink bundles, t-shirts, and posters from previous episodes, all linked in the description. Now back into more art. I continued on this trend for two weeks, seeking more and more of these creatures and doing my best to teach others of the ways to calm them if they did come across them in the wild. One that stuck with me more so than the others was when I found a village that claimed a rock Tyrannus had been menacing the woods nearby. Three hikers had been killed by the creature just recently, and that felt like an odd twist of fate. My sister, Brayla, was killed while seeking an emerald Tyrannus, a known relative of this species. Now, I had an opportunity to use a song she'd taught me to calm this creature. My heart was both heavy and simultaneously soaring as I searched through the woods on foot for this creature. 
I eventually heard its thundering steps somewhere nearby, but it was difficult to pinpoint, so I simply began to sing. I sang through the whole song twice, still searching, but as I started it up a third time, I noticed the footsteps getting closer. I stepped into a clearing just as the towering stony beast did as well. Or perhaps bounding is a better way to put how the creature approached. I didn't even get to see this creature's transition from menacing brute to enthusiastic musician. It stomped up to me already enthralled by the music, thudding its feet and chomping its jaw to the beat of my song. It was like being in the presence of a gigantic puppy. The crystals running along its back glowed to the beat as well, producing a beautiful light that lit up the surrounding trees even in the midday sun. I thought perhaps some sadness would still come from the event, thinking more of Brayla and her death, but any somber notes were washed away by the enthusiasm of this creature and the healing peace my late sister's music was bringing. She may have been a noble and brave warrior in her time, but I think she'd be more proud of this than of any fight I've won, knowing that even in death her memory was inspiring good in this world. My questions do still remain about what parts of the hymns of the Colossals may be true, but regardless of what happened all those centuries ago, I can continue to do my best to ensure that today, this world is the best place it can be. I really like how cute and maybe a little bit sappy this lore ended up turning out. Anyway, with this drawing, it probably turned out to be the most cartoony looking of all the ones in this episode, and I think that's partially because I used a slightly bigger inking brush for it than with the other ones, and I don't have a problem with the fact that it turned out cartoony, or I still really like how it looks. I wouldn't say it's my favorite one of the episode, but thinking about it, I don't really know if I have a favorite. All of these feel very consistent to me. Whereas with something like the Skylanders Monsters episode, which I was comparing this one to a lot in my head, I feel like there is an A plus drawing, an A drawing, and then like a, a B, B plus drawing thrown in there. Whereas this episode, I feel like they're all solid A minus. And I don't say minus because, you know, I have anything significantly wrong with them. It's just, you know, I really like how they all turned out, but none of them are blowing my mind. Still, with this one, I hadn't even really planned in the lore that this last one was going to show up and already be more upbeat. I kind of just worked that into the story because I drew it a little bit peppier looking than some of the other ones. And one little last side note, I cannot for the life of me remember why I made Tayrin's sister named Brayla so similar to Kayla, Tayrin's now girlfriend. I feel like I had to have had a reason for that, but I cannot remember at all what that would have been. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can check out the original Beast Chronicler episode, which is the first story about Tayrin, our narrator of this episode. But anyway, wrapping this up, this has been super fun, and let's take a look. That is some good stuff, and thank you so much to everybody who suggested My Singing Monsters because this was a really fun topic to work with. And let me know what your favorite My Singing Monsters... monsters are in the comments because this is very likely a topic I'll work with again if you all enjoy it. And of course, if you're new to the channel and you enjoyed this, you might also like my Plants vs. Zombies as Dungeons & Dragons Monsters episodes, or maybe my Skylanders as Fantasy Monsters episode. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. Man, I love that I started standing up in my videos so I can hop around a little bit more. Anyway, the quote I'll end with is from an author named Susan David who said that our emotions are data, not directives, and that you should be curious about your negative emotions. I talk a lot about focusing on gratitude and positivity, but that's not to say that you should try and ignore your negative emotions when they happen. They are useful to you. Just try to think about why you're experiencing them and get beyond the surface level of them. If someone insults you, don't just go, oh, they insulted me and that's obviously bad. Think about why that specific insult might have hurt or why that person was trying to hurt you and what about the situation specifically is what has caused the negative emotions. You might find from doing that that there's something with in yourself you can work on so that that same situation in the future wouldn't hurt nearly as much. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday.